basketball on Charge On today after the Knights had one hell of a win against the Memphis Tigers in double overtime last night. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Charge On. As always, I am your host, Sean Green. Before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors, Bet Online. Guys, Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season, everything from NFL and bowl season to esports. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. We're the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite leagues and events. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use promo code BELIEVE to receive your rewards. That's B L E A V to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. Again, you know, we labeled ourselves when we started this podcast as a UCF football pod. We're always going to talk football. I mean, that's what we got into it for. But I am actually, I my first love is basketball. I played basketball for 15 years. Less than I'm 5'10". Knew probably I wouldn't be going much anywhere after high school. But I've always loved UCF basketball. So it's great that we have a team this season, Rob, that we can get behind and a team that really shows up. Uh, they, they've gone on an incredible beginning run to the season. They beat some really good teams and had a couple heartbreaking loss to teams that, let's be real, that Missouri loss was a, a fluke. It was all luck. UCF should have had that win. The Miami was a two-point loss, and they should have had that win too. This team is looking like a March team. It's It's been a while since we've had that sort of team and I think after tonight's win, and we're going to get into it, guys, because last night's win was incredible. We're filming this at 11.15 on Wednesday. We have some football things we're going to talk about after this, and the timestamps are down below. So if you want to hear that, you can go to that. But we're going to talk some of this game because, Rob, I don't know, give your take on it, but it was probably, huh, I can't remember the last time a game was this crazy for UCF basketball. I would probably say... Off the top of my head, obviously the NCAA March Madness game against Duke in the round of 32. That would probably be the first thing that comes to mind about just crazy game. This might have topped it just with how bananas this game was. Yeah, and I think it's even more more so when you know it's in front of a home crowd. I think I, everything we saw from TV, the home crowd was absolutely into it. It's great to see you know Night Nation show up for something other than football. I think men's basketball is really the only other team that that brings out um, you know brings out the fans, and it's great to see the support. I mean, this is a good UCF men's team, and I think going into the season. I think a lot of people were kind of, you know, cautiously optimistic. I think they didn't really know what they were going to get. There's a lot of transfers into the team and they just kind of looked at it and said, I don't know. I mean, this is a completely different team from last year with the exception of CJ Walker, who, you know, was out the season. Um, but uh, you look at the team and you're like, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be good. I don't know what. And now it looks it looks like a March team. This is a legit team that I don't think anybody really wants to play in a tournament. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to say that this is, you know, a team that can go farther than the team that played against Duke. Um, but I certainly think they have the potential to, um, you know, get a March Madness win. I think they have the potential, obviously, to get into March Madness. This is a very good team. Um, and listen, I, I think a lot of people around the country underrate them. I think they look at them and they don't see um, what a lot of us are seeing. I don't, I don't think they're seeing you know, this team that, that can pull it off in, in a tournament style setting. I, I think they're kind of sleeping on UCF. And you, again, you, you read through some of the losses UCF has had, um, you know, they're close losses. They're not getting blown out in a lot of these games. They're not getting, you know, shelled by these teams and they're losing to good teams. You know, at, at the end of the day, bottom line, they're losing to good teams. So I think everything we've seen so far from UCF men's basketball, yes, there's been some disappointing losses. There's been some heartbreak, but they've stayed pretty consistent throughout the entire season. And, and that's going to be crucial uh, if they make March Madness this year. Yeah, and, and we didn't even mention. I mean, should have beat number two at the time, Houston. Now they're number one. You're going to get a chance at them in two weeks to avenge that loss. Now you're going to be at home. And you lost to uh, by six at their place. I mean, listen, 
I think especially being in the American and this team specifically, and we're going to get into this game, but if you beat the teams you're supposed to beat, you're going to be looking really good. I mean, listen, you beat the SMU by like 30, I think. You beat ECU, tough game at, at the end. There's some tough teams in the American. Memphis is a tough team. They do not let up. They do not stop. I mean, Cincinnati, the record doesn't show it, but since he's a tough team, Temple, right now, they're playing some really good basketball. They're 10 and 8, but they're doing really good in the conference. So it's not an easy conference by any means. You have to get through some tough teams. But getting this win is so crucial because, listen, you looked at the bracketology stuff, right? UCF, right now, before this win, was kind of labeled as the first four out. They're good enough, but they were just going to be out. And it's by no means saying this win is going to be oh, the end-all, be-all, right? You never know what's going to happen in the games coming up. But with this win, Memphis was labeled as the first four or last four in, right? So you just beat the team that was labeled as last four in. You have to play them again. But it's good that you beat them at home and not just beat them at home, Rob. Two of your starters are out. Durr was out. Looks like he's got some with his hand, thumb. I don't know. Hopefully we can get back him back because he's a beast inside. He is, I think, one of the most crucial pieces to this UCF team because him and Hendricks together, uh, it's tough. That's length. That is length for you. And Darius Johnson, I mean, he's your starting point guard. And I think there's, I don't want to say a lack of ball handling, because I think a lot of guys can handle the rock on this UCF team, but quality ball handling is so crucial. And Darius Johnson is your guy. He can get to the rim. He's been shooting the three ball much better this season. And you missed that today. But with that being said, Rob, both those guys were out. Taylor Hendricks fouls out in the fourth quarter. It was tough sledding. And guys step up. And I think you said it, and and that's what made it so obvious, right, is you have these guys that stepped up. Ithiel Horton, C.J. Kelly, guys just stepped up and continued to fight. And that's really all you could ask for. I mean, Freeman hitting some clutch free throws. I was nervous as can be. I mean, he has not been a good free throw shooter this year. I was stressed out. My heart still hurts. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm not feeling good. Like my heart has not felt good since after the game. So I'm so happy it's about a win. But kind of just talk about that resilience, Rob. I mean, to have, listen, you have a future NBA player, probably a one and done player on our roster. We haven't had that in ever. I mean, that's just God's honest truth. You have that guy in your roster and he goes out. And what does it say about this team specifically? Because there's not many teams in college basketball that could beat a quality team like Memphis with your star player out with two minutes in, uh, to go in the fourth to basically go toe to toe with Memphis and the players they have to double overtime and pulling out the dub. Yeah. I mean, I think it shows this team's got heart and, and again, that's crucial when you're going into a tournament. I mean, it having heart, having consistency, having guys that can step up in big moments. I think that's, it doesn't get much more crucial than that uh, when it comes to March. So, Having guys that you know clearly can stand, you know, show up and uh, step up for this team, I think is is um, you know really just really just a a crucial thing for this team. And I think um, you know, looking at the squad, uh, there's guys that can step up every night. There's guys like Ethel Horton, who you know is a pretty good three point three point shooter, probably the best three point shooter on the team, uh, and he was drilling shots in overtime and double overtime. Um, you know, you had your rookie step up, you had your, your other guys step up like, um, CJ Kelly, you know, you've had these guys step up in overtime and double overtime that can get the job done. And, you know, I, they weren't perfect in overtime. There was a couple blown leads, you know, granted, it seemed like there was times where they try to get up two, three points and then they'd give them, you know, right back the lead, you know, and they'd, and they'd, uh, concede a basket there was some pressure that memphis put them put on them towards the end of overtime where i think ucf was up like um 84 to 81 or something like that and they turned over the ball and before you know it it's 84 84 again and you know they weren't perfect in overtime but they left it all out there Uh, they left it all out on the court and you see those guys that are you know stepping up for this team that's that's going to be crucial 
in the next couple of months uh, when you're facing, you know, still facing tough teams on your schedule and you're looking for a berth in um, March Madness. So having those guys, knowing those guys can step up when your starters and, you know, your best player on the team is out. Uh, and fouls out, you know, that's going to be imperative. I mean, you you need those guys to step up and they showed they can and they showed that they're going to leave it all on the court and they're going to fight for this team. And that's what this team has. It's got heart and it's got fight. Ethel Horton, 30 points in 45 minutes of game time. I mean, that's we needed all of them. Uh, CJ Kelly put up 21. Now, these stats are unofficial. I mean, we don't have the official stats. For some reason, ESPN doesn't have them. These are what is on Google, so I'm going to go based off that. Seems pretty accurate to me because if you go and look at Memphis's Kendrick Davis, 42 points, five rebounds, four assists. I mean, he killed UCF. That was pretty much... Um, McCaden had 18, but he was the killer. I mean, he had the ball in his hands the entire overtime, fourth quarter, uh, or second half, excuse me, end of the second half. But we're going to talk about officiating. Before we do that, I do want to give a shout out. PG Edwards came in clutch. Red shirt freshman really hit down some, or hit some big shots. Some of those foul calls just weren't fouls. But let's go into officiating because I put out a tweet and I said, it's, it's the worst offici- officiating job I've seen in my recent memory. And I, I watch, you know, magic rough games. I mean, Magic get the worst refs in the NBA. This was one of the worst ref games I've seen all year. Uh, we can even go. We can go down the list. I mean, the the bumps when Davis was driving. I mean, players with their hands up. They're not checking their body. They're moving with them. They are calling fouls every time. Uh, the charges. I mean, they were staying consistent, which I I agree with the commentators. They were staying consistent with the charges, but some of them were just ridiculous. I mean, and then the one where Suggs drove in guy is in the restricted area falls down should have been an and one they no call it okay they you have the should have been goaltending but it wasn't called if you add those two points UCF wins before overtime now those are what ifs right and you don't want to get ahead of yourself and think oh because they would have got those two points but it would have helped UCF was going on those run and on that run those two points would have helped there were so many bad calls, Rob. Oh my, there's so many bad things. Um, I'm trying to even think. Not, not a bad call they made right on it, but like we were talking before, there was the potential shot clock violation that they called on UCF when it pretty clearly touched the outside edge of the rim uh, and even deflected off. And they were they took a they took a good couple minutes looking at that and really trying hard to see if they had to overturn that or not. And and they it did end up overturning it. It was not a shot clock violation, but still the fact that that even yeah. was in question. I, I don't think it was that egregious, but it was pretty. It was pretty like, all right, we're seeing how this officiating, and that's the American for you, though. That's the American. This is what we've seen. Terrible. This is what we've seen in football and basketball since UCF has been in the American. American refing is terrible across the board, and I'm not going to miss it. I'm not saying the big. No, I'm not yeah. saying the Big Twelve is that much better, but the American refing is has always been terrible. Well, set. So, well, let's go. This the Big Twelve is the best basketball conference in all of college oh, absolutely. football. You're you're getting the the best refs, and that's you're getting quality refs. These refs are they were atrocious. Uh, the the I don't know why, and I was heated. Took take took away one point to make it 101, 100 instead of one hundred two. That killed momentum. I mean, you're you're taking five minutes to figure out if the score that was there for the last two minutes is actually the score. That is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. I was seeing them mess with the score. And I'm like, well, why do we have 101 now? It went up to 103, then they went down to 102. Then I'm like, why are we messing with the score here? We've had 102 for the last two minutes. Why did we just go down to 101? I guess they said, oh, they didn't put it in the book. I get, I, Michael Resco, I know what you're doing. We know what you're doing. I get it. You you wanted Penny to win. 100%. I get it. This is a really not great look. UCF with, you know, again, three starters out. The officiating was god awful. And I'm like the American really needs to figure that out because this has been an uh, ongoing problem and especially tonight. They killed the momentum of this game. Like this game should not have been foul this, foul that. There was too many fouls in overtime. I mean, uh, let's be real here, and let's just be 100% honest. Davis had 42. I mean, 
take 14 off in, I mean, now I will say, he's incredible. I mean, he is incredible. Some of the shots he hit, I'm like, I, there's nothing you could do about it. I mean, I think there was the one we were up 49, 43. He comes down, guy goes on the screen, he hits a straightaway three, and it's like, what are you going to do there? His weakness is that he's not a good shooter, and he just hits one right in your mouth. He is incredible. But with that being said, he also got at least 20 free throws. And that's on fouls that were in any other college basketball game, Rob, just basketball plays. College basketball is vicious. It is violent. There are a lot of no calls. It's not like the NBA. Not You know, it, you don't get ticky-tack fouls in college basketball. It's You play through it. And I just felt like this game got too... I'm happy UCF won, but the refs kind of mess with the game way too much. Uh, at the he end, was, he, he was but, getting the James Harden calls, like it, the slightest bit of con- the slightest oh. bit of contact. It's like, all right, that's a foul. No, and thank God, dude, I, at the end where he had like three chances out of three, I'm like, they're bound to call a foul. Like, even though our hands were straight up, they're bound to call a foul with how they've been calling calling this game. So it's like. I mean, and and granted, we were getting calls too, but it was you, they were fouling him every single time, and it's like some of them were fouls. I'm not saying all of, them, but it wasn't all of them. Like half the time, they're nowhere near a foul. And it's listen, UCF is a good defensive team, and they are never getting those calls because they're playing that same defense against every other team. So officiating was garbage. I can't get fined for that. So I can say, I know Johnny Dawkins won't, but I will say it. And for all you Johnny Dawkins haters, where you at now? Um, he is, I mean, to close out this basketball talk, but I mean, you, you kind of said it, Rob. And I think preseason, there was a big, huge question mark. You knew you were getting Hendricks, right? You're like, okay, you're getting Hendricks, but you just are getting all these Senior transfers. I mean, you brought Ithiel Horton from Pitt, uh, CJ Kelly from UMass. You're bringing in all these guys. And in basketball, I was telling you this earlier, and I think it's it is applicable. Most college basketball teams, I don't think can do like can do what UCF is doing. In football, it's different. When you're bringing in transfers, you get nine months to figure out how you're going to work with your new players, with your new teammates. Basketball. There's only 12 to 15 guys on a roster. If you're bringing in these transfers, they need to figure out how to gel. You got to figure out real quick how you're going to gel these couple players together to form a unit. And we were talking about in college basketball, right? You have the one and dones who come on your squad and they're one and done. Then you have the good players that aren't good enough to go one and done. And they stay with you for two, three, four years and kind of build with the program. Darius Johnson, for example, he's a guy that is going to build with the program. He'll stay with us, and he's got a shot at it to go into the NBA. You look at it from a couple years ago. Aubrey Dawkins, uh, you know, you've got players that do that. I was nervous about this year because I'm like, you're bringing in a bunch of transfers. They've never played together. You're basically just meshing a whole bunch of players and saying, hopefully you work out. And I think what stays consistent with Johnny Dawkins and why UCF is so successful is they are good. They are elite on the defensive end. And you said it. Nobody wants to play UCF because, listen, it doesn't matter how their offense is going. Their defense is elite. And they will stop whoever is in front of them. I know, I I will say, I know Memphis put up 104. That was two overtime game. You can kind of scratch that off. But a healthy UCF men's basketball team is a tournament team. And if they're healthy in two weeks, they might... They might have a pretty good chance of being the number one team in the country. Number one team in the country almost lost to USF tonight. I think UCF's got a pretty good shot. But we will move on. We are going to be talking a lot more basketball. I will say that. we This is this is a team, man. I mean, we've kind of been watching. We always take the first kind of 15 games to see uh, what do we get this year. This year, I think, is a special team for sure. All right, let's talk a little bit of football. Guys, we know this is Thursday, January 12th. There are some rumblings. The Big 12 schedule is coming out tomorrow. If that happens, you're going to get another episode this week. We'll go through the schedule. We, I hope it comes out 
I am praying, and all I want, all I want is Oklahoma to visit UCF next season. That's all I want. That's all I pray for. But we got a couple things to talk about very briefly. Uh, I mean, I put out a tweet. Christian Leary, not going to be a knight. Disappointed? Yes. I was really excited about him. Uh, He's now going to Georgia Tech. Am I confused? Yes. I'm very confused. I don't know why. They don't have a quarterback. Who who's the quarterback for Georgia Tech? Now I get it. I get it. Our quarterback situation is somewhat up in the air too, Rob, but I don't know why you go to Georgia Tech. Brent Key, I mean, showed great things end of last season, but whatever. Antonio Greer, he's now going to Arkansas officially. Linebackers are needed. Trent Whittemore. Kind of like a swap, Rob. We swap Leary for Whittemore. Some people call that underwhelming. I say, I think Trent Whittemore, when he was on the field for Florida, he was impressive. Uh, He played in the slot mostly. Uh, Listen, dad was a receiver for us. I think it is great. Darren Henshaw was his dad's uh, quarterback. So you have that connection. I think it's important because Leary was going to play in the slot getting a slot transfer to kind of make up for that loss. But to a lot of people's point, and I want to get your take on it, UCF has an abundance of wide receivers. They do. They get Magwood from Kentucky, so you got an SEC you got two SEC receivers transferring in. Whittemore, I think there's a, a I mean, you have Amari Johnson, who I think could really see some time. Quan Lee, who I know we 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 pound his name into the ground because we co- we keep mentioning him, but I think he's you know he could be a player for us this year. But I do think Trent Whittemore has a lot to prove, and I do think you he could see the field fairly early, depending on how Hinshaw kind of is working this offense. But kind of give your takes on these losses. Let's talk about wide receivers first, and kind of how this kind of changes things, or if it does at all. And then we'll talk about linebackers and the need that UCF needs there. Yeah, so I'll start with Christian Leary. I mean, yeah, obviously a little disappointing. Um, You know, like you said, I think I was a little excited to to see him watch, uh, to watch him, you know, and see him play. Uh, Fast guy, quick guy, really was excited to see what he could do under Darren Henshaw and under, you know, a Gus Malzahn style inspired. Uh, I'm going to say Gus Malzahn offense anymore, hopefully, but uh, nope. <laughs> but at least see what he was going to be able to do with that speed because, you know, that speed can kill. And, and you know, seeing UCF hopefully get back to that quick form, um, you know, that would have been absolutely a welcome addition. But, you know, I think maybe for his career, maybe it makes – a little sense, you know, UCF where he's probably a number two, number three, you know, he probably is going to be the number one, clear cut number one at Georgia Tech in the ACC, even if they're not very good and they don't really have a quarterback yet, um, you know, he can probably be the number one option there. So I think for him, he'll probably get the majority of the targets. He'll get the majority of the receptions and, you know, um, I think he can probably try to show out there. Um, again, wide receiver, not so much of a concern for UCF. I think there is enough, you know, going around. There's enough promise with the wide receiver core that I don't think that's going to be the issue. Um, I think there's other positions of need, and that's where you probably get into linebacker a little bit. Um, you know, I really thought Antonio Greer was going to be that replacement for Jeremiah Jean Baptiste and really, you know, have some veteran leadership. Um, you know, in the linebacking core, uh, but it sucks. I mean, I, I'm of of the two losses. I think losing out on Greer hurts a lot more um, beca- because because linebacker especially is a position of need. Um, you know, again, losing Jeremiah Jean Baptiste, a, a captain on the defense, and getting an experienced veteran like Antonio Greer. Yes, you know, had a hand injury last year, didn't play much. Um, but, you know, in seasons past has been, you know, among among the best linebackers in the American, um, you know, losing a guy like that, losing a, some veteran leadership, probably a, a pretty good locker room presence as well, uh, absolutely hurts. Um, and that's where you see, you know, the player following the coach, obviously believed a lot more in, uh, you know, Travis Williams and follows him to Arkansas, you know, sucks, but you know, it is what it is. And now you got to replace a guy like that. And it's not, not a guy that's going to be a factor for you next year. 
So still concerned on, um, you know, the middle of that defense next year in the linebackers. But no, I think then you talk about, you know, um, Trent Whittemore. I think that's a decent acquisition. Again, didn't really get the looks that I think Florida saw. You know, 2021, he had a much better season, a lot more receptions, a lot more yard, yardage uh, in the limited time that he played. Um, but like you said, mainly a slot receiver, um, you know, and did well with the opportunities he was given, but just never, I, I don't think ever really saw the field as much as maybe Florida fans thought he would see. Um, so now this is an opportunity for him to see the, the field a little bit more. Um, you know, I don't know what UCS plan is for him. Again, there's a lot of guys on this wide wide receiver room, but I think he absolutely can show up in uh, in the spring and, and really, you know, try to cement a start starting place on this team uh, and really make his case. I think there is talent there. There's hands there. Um, I think he's a nice little player. And again, you talked about it. Uh, there's UCF legacy in the family there. It's another another hometown hero. Uh, yes, he was born in Gainesville, but, you know, his dad, Mark Whittemore, was a wide receiver for UCF, played under Darren Henshaw. I mean, uh, there's a UCF connection there. So I'm sure Trent would love to follow in his father's footsteps and really put up some numbers with UCF. And I think he gets an opportunity to do so, you know, leaving the SEC and leaving an SEC team where he's not getting the looks that he probably wants. Um, you know, he might get at UCF with them really trying out and seeing what they have, uh, you know, weapon wise next year. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, I think he was definitely more of a Mullen guy. I know Mullen didn't recruit him, but when Mullen came in, he kind of did show what he can do under Dan Mullen. Uh, obviously with the new staff in Trent was hurt for a lot of this year. He was dealing with injuries, but he could just never get on the field this year. And I think he can show out. I mean, there is a clear cut, you know, number three option open. Now, with this offense, I mean, it's better to have a lot of depth. I mean, replacing guys in and out. I mean, you you know Kobe Hudson and Javon Baker are your number one and two. I mean, those are your two top guys. Number three is kind of open up for grabs. And I think that's also a thing is who's going to show out in, in spring? I mean, again, it's just become so much more important in spring now to show out. Because listen, Gus knows who he likes and who he likes to run in his offense, but it's not his offense anymore. It's Darren Henshaw's. So who is Darren going to be like, okay, I want him in my offense. I he is my I, He's my go-to guy. That's really what the question that we're going to get answered here in a couple months is who are going to be the guys that Darren's like, I need this guy to play. I hope... Demarcus Bowman shows out. I mean, I'm excited to see what he could do. RJ Harvey, that year one to year two leap, but the receivers, and that's kind of been the problem for UCF is it's not a problem, but there's an embarrassment of riches at UCF when it comes to wide receiver. So it's who is going to step up and say, I want to be playing on Saturdays and not just be the guys that are always on the bench and waiting to get that opportunity. I'm excited to see, and it should be very interesting. You mentioned linebacker. We talked about it a little bit. I would be shocked if UCF does not go and hit the portal. Can, like I think you need maybe one or two. Not so much. Go take handouts on some guys. Because I'm not saying that we don't have the guys on the roster. I think Braden Jennings, he's staying. I think that could be a guy for us. But there's not, besides Jason Johnson, there is not a clear-cut another one that you're like, he's a starter. Go out. There are SEC transfer linebackers every single day. Every single day, there's a new one entering the portal. Go out and get one of them. Go out and just try them out. See what they can do. At worst, they sit on your bench, and if you need depth, they bring good depth. Listen, I saw a lot of... Um, Jerry Wilson, safety out of ECU. He just transferred in uh, two days ago, three days ago. Listen, he was an 85 overall rated three-star in the transfer portal. He had a great game against UCF. I looked him up on my and I looked at his footage and I'm like, okay, like, listen, number one, UCF clearly needs to fill that Devon Wilson role. They kind of, they've hit the portal hard with Mask and now uh, Wilson to kind of see, okay, like, let's get some depth. Let's see because we don't know. Let's go see who can start. And UCF Guido, who is a fan of us, he is a fan, but. UCF Guido can be a little bit of negative. Negative Nancy sometimes. I mean, he's he can be negative. He said, are we really booming every player? I mean, two to three star from ECU boom. And yes, we're going to boom every player. Because guess what? In 
Nine months, he could be your starting safety and be putting up monster numbers. And you're going to be like, oh, wow. Like, so that's what I'm saying. Go get the players to get some depth. That's what the transfer portal is for. Go replace your starters. Go get some quality depth from your team. Because God forbid what happens. Everybody wants to complain and say, why is UCF wasting scholarships on wide receivers? You have so many. God forbid what happens if your two starting wide receivers go down. Who do you have to replace them? And I think that's what's quality about UCF is, listen, you have guys to replace those guys. It's not, the problem with UCF had always been, their top guys go down, they have nobody else. You have quality depth. And I think that's why Gus and staff are doing an excellent job in the portal. They're not just going out and getting, just throwing offers out to whoever will accept them. I mean, they are being very meticulous about who they want, who will fit in the system. And listen, Length, I think, is key. They they want length. They're getting length. And I think when you look at Trent Whittemore, you look at Wilson, you look at whoever the linebacker is going to be, you're getting that quality depth that I think UCF fans want and desire. And I think it's making the team better. And I think that's what excites us is, listen, this is looking like another great roster. There are a couple, couple things we need to, to figure out. The linebacker position is probably number one. But once you figure that out, I think this team is is looking really good going to that first year, and you don't know who else they're going to get. I mean, that, that's we have no idea every day if they're going to go get a new player. So it's it, it's really it is up in the air, Rob, and that's what makes it so exciting. Is this team's already pretty good? You just gotta, you know, we'll see what happens in spring. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think. You know, this team is very, you know, um, there's a lot of unexpectedness with this team. Uh, there's a lot of surprise booms that happen. You know, there's the ones that we expect and you follow for a couple days. And it's like, oh, crystal ball, you know, oh, they're tra- after this transfer. It looks like this transfer is going to be going to UCF, just following their social media and stuff like that. But then there's the surprise booms and stuff like Trent Whittemore that come out of nowhere. And you're like, oh. Oh, there's your uh, Christian Leary replacement. Uh, And it's almost immediate, like right after, like I think it was less than 24 hours after Christian Leary decommits from UCF and goes to Georgia Tech, uh, up shows Trent Whittemore. So, you know, I I think even if it's not like sometimes the most exciting transfers, um, you know, you're still getting these guys in and it is next man up and it's always been next man up. I mean, that was a philosophy under Josh Heupel as well was next man up. You got to get these guys in that, you know, if God forbid you, you lose a player um, on offense or defense, it's got to be next man up. You're uh, the, the person under them is going to be expected to, you know, step up. It's a lot like um, it's, it's a lot like that Heupel era where you have to look at guys that are, you know, available on your roster and it doesn't hurt to have more depth. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game. The best teams in the country have depth and yes, it is quality depth that you need, but you know, I think UCF has been going after quality guys, at least on paper, they're going after quality guys that can uh, really shore up the depth on this team. And and God forbid, if anything happens to members of the defense on the offense, there, there are those guys that can step up into a starting role. 100%. 100%. And we'll see. I mean, the Harris twins, we don't know what what's going on with them. If I had to guess, they're going to Arkansas. So if I'm a UCF fan, just don't get your hopes up. That'd be great. Those are two linebackers that you could really use and build around in the future. Uh, but who knows? But we've got a lot of stuff coming up with UCF. I mean, you got National Sign Day in February. You got the schedule release that we are just, we are waiting to hit the record button. Just give us the schedule. We will get right out. That's the thing. We haven't even been able to do our our season ending review. I mean, we really haven't. I mean, we we haven't gone through the the roster that's in the works. But we again, you know, we we record one episode a week now with the off season, and unless more news comes out, that's that's kind of how it's going to stick. But continuous UCF news uh, heading into spring ball. Uh, in the next couple months. But like I said, we will be releasing, as soon as the schedule drops, we are releasing an episode. It will come up right away, give our thoughts on kind of, in our way too early predictions. We will do all of that uh, undefeated season next year, obviously. Um, Rob, kind of just final thoughts on big time UCF 
men's basketball dub. March Madness bound 100%. Uh, and just UCF athletics in general. Anything you want to uh, close out on? No, I mean, it's an exciting time, I think. You know, UCF football was a little bit of a disappointment, but there's still reason to be excited about the team going into next year. Uh, there's still, you know, a lot of excitement surrounding the team and the fan base uh, when it comes to football. And, but I think everybody's super excited for men's basketball right now. And I just like, I like when UCF has other options to watch. As much as I love college football, college football is my first love when it comes to collegiate sports. It's kind of the only collegiate sport I watch with, I dabble in men's basketball and even sometimes UCF men's baseball. Um, but no, it's just nice when the team is good. When UCF men's baseball was pretty good last year, they're fun to watch. It's fun to go to games. When UCF men's basketball is really good, people show up and, and, and they show up in droves and they really support the team and they get loud. So just having other options, uh, for collegiate sports at UCF, I think is, is really nice because, you know, when we unfortunately have to put a lid on the football season, there's still stuff that we can go and watch that, you know, really sates the taste of uh, a UCF fan and a sports fan. And it's just nice to see UCF men's basketball, I think, really good again. I mean, last year was a disappointment. Really since the Duke year, it's kind of been disappointment after disappointment. You know, UCF coming up short and just not getting it done. And I think they actually have a chance this year. I mean, I don't know who they're going to get paired against if they end up doing making the tournament and qualifying. Um, but I think there's a good chance that they can, you know, win one or two games. there, just depending on who they're matched up against. They're tough. They're tough against whoever they play. So I'm excited. It's a fun team to watch. UCF sports is just, and it's a great era. I mean, it's, it's insane to imagine where we are in the time as always, but a lot more news, a lot more stuff to talk about and always very fun. Also the magic. They're doing pretty well. I love watching uh, that other hometown team that I love dearly. Uh, Apollo and Franz, the next two superstars of the NBA. They, they are them. Um, they are, they are them. them. The, uh, Franchero. <laughs> Franchero. 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 And Jonathan Isaac made his return tonight. So, I mean, with the Lakeland Magic. that was 15 a points, watch, five rebounds. Yeah. Back like he never left. He looked good. Definitely looked winded in the second half, but good to good to see him back on the court. All right, guys. This has been Charge On. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Again, I will mention it for the 50th time. We will be dropping a schedule release episode. And please, give your thoughts. As soon as we drop this episode, give your thoughts on the men's basketball team. You know, our, our recent transfers, transferring out. Uh, and kind of what your thoughts are on the schedule. I know we have our first three games up. Looking pretty good for a three and no start, and but we'll get into all of that. Uh, and once that schedule drops, we will record an episode, get it right out to you. So you know, follow me on Twitter at Sean M R Green. Follow us on or subscribe on YouTube, all of our audio platforms to be notified when a episode drops. And also, like seventy nine percent of you are not subscribed on our YouTube channel. So please, you watch the video, just subscribe. It's very easy. We're almost at 100 subscribers. Only been doing this for five months, four months. Pretty good, and I appreciate all the support. All right, this has been Charge On, presented by Bet Online. We will see you whenever this damn schedule drops. Uh-huh.